Okay. The mic is high. So the reason that we're recording this, so you know, not, none of the participants are in the recording, uh, but one of the things that I do, because this class uh, is on Tuesdays, um, Tuesday at 5.30, Thursday at 5.30, and then Sunday morning at 8.30, some of the people that come during the week don't make it on Sunday. This is the only class that we videotape the talk, and so I post it on YouTube so people can go there and listen to the talk. Um, and the, the way that that works is the people in the class, um, we have an email list of everybody that participates in this class, which right now we have 55 people. Uh, they don't all come at once, but you know, they come to the class. Um, and the email list is a way that, we, that I communicate with the class in terms of sending out links to articles, links to YouTube sites, you know, links to book lists and so forth to give them resources. And when we do the video, um, I send a link to the video on YouTube out every week so people can click that link and watch the talk. And uh, the talks are, you know, the way, we, the way the class works is each class I do a talk I've been teaching for 40 years, and I'm a psychologist, so I try and talk about things that will help people to be motivated to practice, because as, if you're a practitioner, you understand what I mean. Right? Uh, practice is the most important aspect of this, and it's the challenge to practice consistently without fail and to practice uh, consistent technique so you're not all over the place, you know, so you can... Uh, accomplish something in terms of training your mind and changing your brain. The other thing about the practice that I try and shed light on is that I think the more you understand about how all that works, the more intentional you can be about it. You know, if you're a car mechanic and you know how to change the spark plugs or change the oil, but you don't have any understanding of how the engine works, you're not going to be as effective as somebody that does because they can listen to the engine, they can understand how if something's wrong, you know, uh, where the problem may be because they understand how the whole system works. And so uh, I think the same thing is true with this. The more, um, even in the Eastern traditions where people are uh, practicing and studying the contemplative practices, uh, and, the, and, the, and the contemplative teachings, um, the, the way that's done is that they become students of the practice, students of meditation, students of the understandings or the teachings that are associated with what you're practicing. And so that's a key aspect of these practices as far as I'm concerned. I know in my own practice it's made a significant difference to be a student of what I'm practicing. And in today's world, uh, what that means with the current uh, mindfulness movement is to uh, be a student of brain science because in, in today's world, uh, the, brain, the brain science is a, a very critical aspect of why this is so important now because we now have scientific research that shows uh, that this is not just a spiritual endeavor this is a very practical endeavor that has to do with changing the brain in very significant ways that make a huge difference. And uh, the part of the research has shown that uh, practicing these practices doesn't just cause what, cause what they call a state change, in other words, a, 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 a temporary change, or that you're changing your brain or your mind when you're practicing, but if you practice consistently over time, that their trait changes, meaning that these changes become permanent, they become the way you are. And that's very significant because that's revolutionary because of uh, the advent of neuroplasticity, because we know the brain changes throughout the lifespan. 
this opens up a whole new realm of possibility for people because it means that if you take these practices seriously and if you practice them with the intention of, of causing significant changes in your mind and your brain and your behavior, that you can do that. And you don't have to uh, have a spiritual context to do it. You can do it in a pragmatic, scientific way, a secular approach. And that's one of the aspects of the new mindfulness movement that's become so popular. And on Sunday mornings, I try and uh, talk a little bit and respond to questions and then uh, we spend a little more time sitting on Sundays than we do on the weekdays because it is a morning. During the weekdays, it's a late afternoon. Sunday morning, people are, are more available to sit. It's easier to sit for people in the morning. And I want people to experience a longer sit. And, um, a lot of practitioners, especially new people, uh, tend to start sitting 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 20 tops. Which is fine, you know, that's, the important thing is consistency, not duration, right? So, that's great, but at the same time, uh, I would like to s instigate and stimulate and inspire people to consider these practices important enough to work on extending that time. Uh, because one of the things we know scientifically is although there's a revolutionary possibility available here for the, through these practices. Um, for that to occur, given the fact that you've been practicing, the brain's been practicing the way it's been being all these years for most people, uh, in order to change that, you have to really dedicate yourself to some serious practice. So it's not going to change overnight and it's not going to change uh, if you just dabble in meditation. It'll make a difference but if you really want to see significant changes in the brain and, and in the mind, and if you want to have a significant shift in your experience of your life qualitatively, then you have to really get serious and commit yourself to meditating for longer periods of time. In brain science, they, in the research they've done on brains, uh, the differences they've seen in people who practice is based on thousands of hours of practice. How many thousands of hours has somebody practiced? For example, some of the monks that they've studied uh, in live brain scans have practiced for 30,000, 40,000 hours, have practiced, have practiced for decades. And their brains are significantly different than other people's brains. But that's directly related to the, you know, how serious they have been as far as the practice is concerned. And the other thing about those people is that they are people who have also studied, have been serious students of the contemplative practices. Um, there, many of their studies have been with the um, um, Asian traditional teachings, whether it be, you know, uh, Indian uh, philosophy, Taoist philosophy, Zen, uh, Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, they've studied uh, the teachings from that perspective. Uh, but even those people in, in, in contemporary times, even those people now are very interested in the brain science. The Dalai Lama is very interested in the brain science. And one of the things, and he's one of the most famous serious practitioners. I mean, here's a guy that's practiced meditation from when he was able to talk and walk. Uh, so he knows something about it. and. Um, with the advent of brain science, he has said that uh, he wants to meet with brain scientists and physicists and psychologists to learn what they see and know and what the research shows. And if that research shows that some of the beliefs or some of the understandings or teachings from the ancient traditions are, uh, are not valid, that they're misunderstandings, that, they, that he wants to change that. So we're, we're, it's really East and West coming together. Even in terms of psychology, over the last several decades, the understanding of the human being psychologically and emotionally uh, has become an East and West synthesis, where we have learned a lot about who we are and how the mind works uh, from Eastern teachings and practices. 
and combining that with modern science has created a hybrid that is now being practiced even in psychotherapy it's a different practice now with mindfulness so before I get into anything I, there, there's something I have uh, an interest in talking about that I think could be useful but before I do that I just want to give you all who are here an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have in relationship to your practice you know I'm assuming I'm just I will assume that if you're coming to this class that you understand the importance of establishing a practice in your life not just come to class and practice that's the intent here so I'm assuming if you come to class that you you're up to that whether you have done it or not that you're up to that or that you have done it and you are practicing consistently each day for a certain period of time and so if you're in either one of those categories and you have questions about what you're doing how it works uh, challenges things that you're coming up against in terms of barriers or obstacles I, I want to make sure to give you the opportunity to ask questions so do you have any questions about your practice Well, the reason, yeah, the reason that that uh, that Dan Harris presents that in in his latest book, and and uh, Anderson Cooper spoke about it, right? Other people speak about it. There are other teachers that speak about it. The reason they're doing that is because they're trying to really make this practice available to people. And if you, if and if the only way you can see the practice is that you must. Uh, sit for an extended period of time um, and you must sit still in a chair or with your legs folded on the floor that starts to limit things for people in terms of what they can do I mean there was a time not that long ago that most people um, thought that if you're gonna practice meditation you gotta sit on a cushion on the floor with your legs crossed right that was what you had to do and right away that eliminated a lot of people because a lot of people just couldn't do that that's that's not an easy thing to do right I mean I, I practiced that way for a while and you have to go through a period of, of just getting used to sitting that way so now that's changed and um, so now it's pretty uh, much established and understood that sitting in a chair is fine it's absolutely unnecessary to sit on the floor with your legs crossed and not only is that the case but it's been also established that sitting meditation is one form of meditation there are other forms of meditation that are just as powerful and just as useful there's walking meditation there's other forms of moving meditation I teach Tai Chi Cha which is a form of moving meditation and my experience of that practice is that is actually my experience of that practice is it's actually more powerful than sitting meditation sitting meditation has gotten a lot of uh, attention and it's fashionable and all that jazz but uh, the moving meditation in my experience has been actually more powerful in terms of the the effect that it has on my psyche the fact that it has on my uh, physiology and the way that it change has been changing the mind and the brain so but as far as these practices are concerned the idea behind all that is to be flexible because the key here is is teachers want the students to to practice right and so what they're basically saying and there's two schools of thought about this one what they're basically saying is any way that you practice is practice versus not practice so if the only thing that you can pull off for some people sitting for five minutes feels impossible right? so if the only thing you can pull off in order for you to start to practice is one minute at a time then do that then you're at least you have a practice at least you got your foot in the door at least you're doing something to be related to the practice right and so if you do that if you do it seriously and and sincerely the way it's meant to be done 
in terms of really stopping and, 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 and being still and just quickly scanning your body and letting go of tension and then focusing on your breath just for one minute. It's still, you're still doing a technique and you're still doing the technique in some time frame and the rapidity, the consistency with what you do that will have the even the one minute matter make a difference. So one way that you could have doing it one minute be more powerful is to practice remembering to do it as many times as you can each day. One teacher that I'm familiar with encouraged people who are doing the one minute uh, approach to do it at least 12 times a day. Because then you're getting the, you're, you know, you're getting the consistency, you're, you're coming to it again and again and again. And one of the things about these practices that's important is the idea of, of becoming familiar with the experience. Getting to a place where when you meditate and you relax the body and you focus attention, there's a shift in your awareness, there's a shift in how you're experiencing things. And to just to become familiar with what that feels like is a valuable, aspects of the pra a valuable aspect of the practice. Familiarizing yourself with the experience. So my answer to your question is uh, do, uh, do whatever works best for you, you know, in terms of, for, you know, for some people they say in the morning seems to work best. Some, po some people say in the evening seems to work best. Um, the way a lot of these contemporary teachers are talking, like Dan Harris and, and company, is to do as much as you can in any way that works for you to do it, right? So in his case, he's committed to practicing two hours a day. That's a big commitment, right? Anybody that has a commitment to practicing two hours a day ha must be understanding what's possible, must be understanding the, the value here, must be understanding what could be accomplished by doing this in order to make that kind of a commitment. And this guy made that commitment, and he was a guy when he first made contact with meditation, uh, he thought it was a joke. You know, I mean, in his fir first book, 10% Happier, uh, he talks about how a fidgety, skeptic person became a meditator. Uh, so that's a big transition for him to come from a place where he thought it was laughable to meditate to becoming a person who practices two hours a day. And so for him, he has a commitment to that two hours. And the way he accomplishes that is like, as he said, sometimes he can get an, a half hour in in the morning, but he's got a small kid. And so sometimes that just doesn't happen. He's a very, very successful, you know, TV personality, business person. He's got a lot going on, traveling all the time. And so the way he approaches it, he's got the goal of getting the two hours done. And if he doesn't get a half hour in in the morning, then he's got to fit it in somewhere else, right? So he, he practices in taxi cabs, on airplanes. Um, when he's at the studio, he's, he's an anchorman for ABC News. When he's at the studio, you know, he'll go and sit in a place that is quiet for 15 minutes. So he just gets it to add up, right? to uh, two hours. So it's kind of interesting, you know, I was talking to Frank about the fact that um, uh, I'm, I'm working on my diet and my physical exercise program. And uh, uh, they have great software for, for working on that stuff now. And I found this piece of software that you can use. Uh, and it helps you monitor what's going on in terms of your exercise and your diet and your nutrition. And the way you monitor it is that you, every day, you, uh, you start to put in exactly what you're eating calorie-wise. Oh, well, first you set a goal, right? First you set a goal. You say, well, okay, in two months or in three months I want to be at this weight, right? And then it calculates how many calories you have to stay under every day in order to get there, right? So now the game's on, right? So this is the same thing as practicing meditation in a way. If you say, okay, I understand what this could be. I understand that this could actually change my mind and my brain, could make a difference in my physical body. It can change my habit patterns. It can change the way I relate to myself and my life. It can change the way, it can change my relationships. It can have me live longer physically, you know. If you, if you really avail yourself to all that, if you really get all that, and you really understand that that's true, and because you see the truth of that, just like in the case where people come here and exercise, 
The reason they're doing that is because they know it's going to make a difference, right? I mean, you know, they have to deal with their laziness or their habit patterns to sleep later and not do it, right? Or have other things be more important. But they're willing to deal with that and go through whatever it takes to get here to do the exercise. Why? Because there's a goal in the future. They see a possibility. I can have a fit body. I can be healthier. I can live longer, right? I can look better, right? So they keep their eye on that ball. That's the vision, right? And then that becomes what motivates them to try and find whatever ways they can work with in order to keep steady with the practice of the physical fitness. And this is no different. One of the things I harp on around here is that if you're doing that and you understand the power and the value and the importance of that, then please allow yourself to appreciate the fact that if you do that and you don't work on your mind and your brain and you don't change your emotional well-being and you don't change your mental fitness, you're not fit. You're physically fit, but that physical fitness isn't fitness. It is not well-being. You are not healthy. And, you, and, it, and it will not produce happiness. Physical fitness will not produce happiness. If you see the value and the importance of this, and you put a program together where you have practicing mental fitness, practicing emotional fitness, and physical fitness, then you have well-being. Then happiness can be yours from putting that program together. And so this business of using these, this diet program, it's very interesting to translate that into how you would use that to do a meditation practice. Because the diet program says, okay, what's your goal? What weight do you want to be at by when? So you put that in and then it says, okay, in order to get that, you have to stay under these calories a day. And so every day you have to put the data in so you have the information there about what you're eating and it's feedback. You're monitoring, you're getting constant feedback about what you're doing. And by the constant feedback, every day you can see whether you went over your calorie limit or under it. And if you went over it, the feedback is telling you you're not doing what needs to happen to get what you want, to get where you want to go, right? That's very powerful because it gives you immediate information about where you're at in relationship to the goal you set, right? And so then you have to ask yourself, you know, what am I doing? If I'm not doing what it takes every day to get what I want in the future, then maybe I need to take a look at that and see what's exactly happening so I can make some adjustments in order to get on track. Right? That in itself is a very important process for people that many people don't take the time to, to look at and analyze, right? And then, you know, in that program, it also says that um, if you're exercising, you can monitor your exercise in terms of how many calories that is, and you can plug that into the equation. And the more you exercise, the more you can eat and still stay under the caloric right, limit, right? So now you have some flexibility, right? This is the same thing with meditation, right? If the goal is, if you set a goal for yourself, uh, I'd like to be able to meditate an hour a day or two hours a day, right? And in order to accomplish that, you can do it one of two ways. You can either do it in long sits, right, which are obviously more challenging, right? Or you can do it in shorter sits combined with a little longer sit. So you can mix and match to get the goal, right? And the thing that you want to understand is the more frequently you can practice the medita mindfulness meditation and the, the longer the duration of those practices, the more powerful the whole process will be in terms of getting your results, yes? And that seems to be pretty evident, right? And so you want to be related to that, right? So you want to be related to that. So if you're, if you're practicing, if you start a practice and you're practicing five minutes a day and you find that to be very challenging, okay, it's very challenging. Are you willing to be, are you willing to get related to that challenge in a way where you're willing to, to, to push the window? that you're gonna sit for 10 minutes, right? And you already have this apprehension about it because five minutes wasn't easy for you to sit, right? And so you sit for 10 minutes just to experience yourself getting through it, right? This is the way you work with it, right? And then if you get through it for 10 minutes, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, right? Let me see if I can change from five to 10. This is the way you work with mindfulness. 
ultimately the practice of mindfulness if you do it consistently over time it shifts from being something you're practicing to becoming a way that you are that's the goal you want my, you want to be a mindful person which means you want to be a person who it's your nature it becomes the way you are to be aware of your attention able to focus and direct your attention at will and to be aware of your body in such a way on the fly consistently that you can intentionally create a relaxed state physically that's power right that's very powerful right so that's the way you want to be you want to be able to get to a place where your mindfulness practice becomes what you're doing all the time and so if you understand that then you then you understand okay the the formal practice is a way to, in, to, to practice being mindful in an intensive way where I can see more clearly exactly what's happening in the practice and experience what it feels like to do that practice. But then at some point, I want to be able to, to do that in the course of my ordinary day. I want to be able to, as one of the teachers said, practicing the technique is easy it's a relatively easy technique remembering to practice is hard right because you you get distracted right you get into your habit patterns you get into your regular way of being in the day right and that kind of takes you away from the whole idea of practicing in such a way to even remember to do it becomes a difficult thing and so if you understand that you can you can use psychological tactics to do this, right? You can, for example, you can do a simple thing. You know, some uh, people who are uh, practicing the traditional uh, practices, uh, they put bracelets on, right, that have a particular meaning in, in the tradition. But outside of that, the fact that the bracelet's there, every time they see that bracelet, it reminds them of the practice. So this is a way of setting, up, setting your life up to work as far, as far as accomplishing the goal of having a practice, right? On your smartphone, you can set alarms, right? You can set alarms to go off. If you want to do the one minute practice, right? And you're serious about it, right? Set alarms to go off once every hour. And once every hour, you practice for one minute. So these are ways that you can, just like the diet program, right? One of the things we know psychologically is anything that you're getting constant feedback about automatically changes, right? So one of the ways that uh, we work with people who are trying to change addictive behaviors, for example, is to train them to be conscious of what's going on with them as it relates to the behavior. In other words, if you want to quit smoking, start to pay attention to your mental state, to your emotional state as it relates to the behavior, and then pay attention to the behavior itself when you're doing the behavior, and really slow down and let yourself be aware of exactly what you're doing when you're smoking the cigarette. See if you can notice what's happening when the uh, idea arises in your mind to smoke a cigarette. What you'll discover is that cigarettes are a distraction. It's a way of getting away from discomfort. You've heard people say, I need a cigarette. Mm -hmm. right? they're, they're saying I need a cigarette because something's going on right now that I want to get away from. And so if I go have a cigarette, I can get away from what's going on. Right. So if you start to see what's happening, if you start to pay attention to what's happening, just the awareness of what's happening itself starts to become a natural process that moves in the direction of change. If you start to be aware of smoking a cigarette, instead of just being distracted and being in a mindless state, you become mindful when you're smoking the cigarette. People who have done that have reported, this is research, people who have done that have reported that when they became mindful and smoked a cigarette, it was disgusting, that it tasted terrible, it smelled terrible, it felt terrible to do it. They felt bad about being a person that was doing that at that time, right? So just the awareness itself allowed them to experience it in such a way that it was different and rather than serving a purpose, it started to become something that was a negative experience. 
And then they naturally gravitated away from it. They naturally lost interest in it. They didn't want to do it anymore. This is scientifically researched, and they found that just by being mindful about what you're doing when you have an addiction like smoking, has you have more ability to be effective in changing that behavior than any other technique. Research has shown that that's the case. And so that's a very important thing to understand, right? That just paying attention, which is mindfulness, and allowing yourself to be aware of what's actually going on and not going off into thought, not going away, right? Not going off into um, uh, thoughtlessness or wa mind wandering, but staying tuned in to what's actually going on with an intention of really wanting to see what's happening here, that in itself will change your life because you'll begin to see things you weren't paying attention to before that are important things to see, important feedback, important information to see. For example, one of the things that people see when they start to pay attention more consistently is that whenever they're feeling uncomfortable, what comes up for them in, in, an, in a compulsive way is to escape somehow. And so they start seeing how the dots are connected. When I'm uncomfortable, uh, I have an interest in turning on the television so I can distract myself with the television. And a lot of people are watching TV. This is how, how this is so uh, elusive. People actually, there are a lot of people that actually come home at night right, have dinner and watch TV. They're not watching something in particular, they're just watching TV. They don't even care what's on. They just want to watch it, right? It's like a relief. I'm going to watch TV now, right? Uh, well, fi I'll find something to watch, right? Why? Because I want to be in a situation where I can be distracted by the television. If you begin to see what you're actually doing, you begin to see you're checking out of your own life. You're checking out of your own life. You're not there for your life and you're giving yourself over to a distraction that is not only mindless, but worse, right? In terms of what's on TV, right? What's on TV? You're training yourself to be attracted to murder. These are the things that are popular on TV, yes? Cop shows, right? 911. You're training yourself to be attracted to murder, desperation, suffering, right? Negative news, because that's pretty much what's on the news, right? So you're training, you're training yourself and you're training the brain to be addicted in, re in relationship, not only to something that's distracting you, but something that's training your brain to be addicted to something that has nothing to do with your well-being and everything to do with establishing a negative experience of yourself in your life. No wonder people come up with the conclusion, life sucks and then you die. If what you're paying attention to is all the negativity, right, and all the horror and all of the desperation that goes on in the world, which is what people find interesting and attractive, right, which is also crazy, right, because one of the ways that that works psychologically is I like to watch how terrible things are from my living room on my couch where that's not happening to me. See, you see the insanity? This is insane, right? So one of the things that I think is very important to motivate yourself to deal with what you have to f deal with to do these practices is to understand what's at stake. If you look at what I just got done talking about, what you'll see is the bottom line here is what's at stake is your life itself. Your life itself. Every time you distract yourself from what's going on in your world, you're, you're removing yourself from your own life. You know, you, people don't think about it this way, yes? Distraction as well? Depends. It depends on the book. It depends on your intention. It depends on the way you're relating to what you're doing, right? Now, for most people, what I'm saying, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, so I don't think that this is just my idea. For most people, whether it's a book, a movie, alcohol, cigarettes, television, even fitness, without consciously understanding what you're doing and being present for it and being mindful about it, it's probably a distraction. It's probably something you're using to avoid your own life. Just listen to that statement. You're using these things to avoid your own life. No wonder you're depressed. <laughs> you, you don't have a life. You're not in your life. You're in your head. 
You're in the book. You're in, in the television, right? You're living a life of distraction from your own life. This is so critical to understand, right? You're not present for your own life. And if you look at that in terms of the, how chronic that becomes for people, right? It becomes such a chronic habit pattern. They're so established in that habit pattern and they're so embedded in denial about what they're doing that if you present it to somebody, there are a lot of people that if you present that to them, they'll fight you and argue with you and tell you, no, that's not true. That's not true. Because they begin to feel threatened by the idea that if it is true, I pissed my life away. And unfortunately, I think the reality of it is for most of humanity, you know, this is, this, is, this, is, this is why we live in a desperate world. For most of humanity, there are people who are born, live, oh no, I can't, it's not, live's not the right word. There are people who are born, exist, and die, and never live. Born, exist, and die, and never live. They become a, a repetitive pattern of behavior. They become, they're living in a role. Right now I'm a father, then I'm a son, uh, then I'm a teacher, then I'm a worker, then I'm a religious practitioner. Then I'm the, so they're living in roles, right? There's no real experience of anything going on. It's all automaticity. Get up in the morning, it's the rat race, right? You get up in the morning, you keep going through the same pattern over and over again, right? And, and one of the things that happens when people are in that rat race is they, they, they have a sense of it being a repetitive pattern, you know, like uh, uh, Groundhog Day, right? You ever see that movie? Right? The thing that guy wanted the most is to get out of this pattern. I'll do anything to get out of this pattern, right? So it was really a metaphor for an ordinary life, right? That people get stuck in a pattern, right? So the problem is, to, in order to get out of the pattern, you have to face the fact that you don't have any real connection to yourself. You don't have any real experience of what, who and what you are. You can't get out of the pattern as the role. You can't get out of the pattern as the role. You can't get out of your personality as the personality. You can only get out of the personality as the self. The self is the awareness that was there before the personality even got put together. Right? These are the things that I think are very, very important to, to delve into, to, to engage with, to study, to come to an understanding, a clear understanding about, so, so that you're clear that what you're doing is saving your own life when you do these practices. What you're doing is getting yourself related to reality, getting yourself related to life instead of living in your head and going through these consistent patterns of distracting yourself. Does this make sense? Yes. So that's why I think it's important to spend some of our time together talking about these things so that you're not just doing a technique without a context. So you're not just doing a technique without understanding the importance and the value of the technique and how that works so you can really engage with it in a serious manner and really take it on in such a way where you have a mindset about it where you're saying to yourself, Given what this is about and given how important this is and what this has to offer me, I want to work at this. I want to expand the duration of time I'm able to sit in doing the formal practice. And I want to work in practicing being mindful as a way of life. I want to work in practicing being mindful all the way through the day. Serious practitioners will say that if you really want to take this to its end goal, if you re really want to take this all the way, then you have to understand that at some point you have to have the goal that your life is the practice. That, that's when the formal practice ends and it's not even necessary to do sitting meditation anymore because you've got enough consistency and stable attention to recognize the fact that the ultimate practice is life itself. Your life is the practice. So every moment of your life you're coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back bringing your attention back to what's going on and noticing what the thought process is and what the feeling states are. So you're present to what's happening, present to what's happening. And because you're present to what's happening, you won't energize useless habits. You just won't do it because you're seeing reality. This is the way out. And you can only use this to get out if you make the distinction at some point that you are not a personality 
As a personality, you can't escape your personality. Do you understand? Your personality won't escape itself. It can't escape itself. So. Any questions? One of the people that I would recommend that you listen to, I've been listening a lot to this guy recently. Um, his name is Paul Hederman. And he came from a, uh, a uh, recovery background. Here's a guy that was a, a completely lost soul. Uh, he, was, he was a really lost cocaine addict. I mean, all the way. His life was about getting high. His life was about the next fix, right? And he came across these, these uh, spirituality and meditation and he dabbled in it, right? And then at some point, he actually had a life-changing revelation. And that life-changing revelation was he saw that he wasn't his personality. And having seen that, it changed him forever. From the moment he had that experience, he never touched another drug. He went from totally addicted to nothing, just from that insight. Right? And this is something that if you look historically backward, right, you'll see there are instances historically where people have these life-changing experiences, like Eckhart Tolle, right, if you know his story, right? He, had, he was suicidal, right? And he had this experience that he wasn't the person who wanted to kill himself. Boom. That was the end of that. That was the end of that story. And then he lived his life from that point on as the truth of himself, which is awareness. And now he can speak very clearly and very intelligently and very powerfully about that because it's who he's being. You know what I mean? It's not, he's not sharing with you something he learned. He can, talk, he can talk off the cuff about it because that's what's happening for him. Very easy to talk about. Same thing with this guy, Paul Hederman. After he had this experience, he started going, he was involved with AA, and he started going to his AA groups and talking about it, right? And it started to like move away from the AA uh, structure and became a conversation that had its own power that wasn't necessarily just AA. And that was 30 years ago, and ever since then he's been traveling around the world doing talks, it's his life. It's his life to do talks. And he's discovered a way of talking very precisely about how to see the difference between who, you're, who you've been being and who you are. And how that it, it's a very dicey distinction, right? Because who you're being, the personality that you are, can't hear, can't, can't see or hear who you really are. Because the personality that you are, and here's the trick, and I'll just say this so we can move on and do a practice. But if you listen to Paul Hederman, you know, he's a very, uh, he's a regular guy, he talks in regular street talk, so you have to not, like, you, know, you have to not react to any of that. Just listen to the message. Try and listen to the message. He's got, tr he's got all kinds of videos out there. But what he, one of the things he says that's very important is that When people listen to the conversation about understanding that you're not your personality, it gets very dicey because the personality is hearing the conversation. So you can, can you see the problem? The personality is hearing the conversation about itself not existing. It, that won't happen. The, the personality, so what happens is the personality tries to, to the personality try because it, it, it hears the problem. The personality hears the problem, and then it tries to get free from itself as itself. <laughs> you see how that's impossible, right? So in other, in other words, it's saying the same thing is you want to be liberated, you want to be free from the tyranny of the way your mind works, which is a personality, right? You want to be free from that, but you want you to go, you want you, you want you to still be there. You want you to take you want you to, to, to be there for the freedom, right? But the, but the problem is, the freedom is that you're not there. The freedom is that you're experiencing what you are, not as a personality. 
So he gets really into, he's got a very good way of really uh, making that absolutely clear. And one of the things he says is that, is that if, you, if you see it, if the message gets through your personality and hits the target, which is what you really are, the awareness itself, right? Then, then it'll just flip. You can't flip it, it'll just flip because one of the things he says is when he does talks, he's not talking to the personality. The personality can't understand what he's saying, can't hear what he's saying. He's talking to the, to the true self. He's talking to your awareness. He's talking to who you really are. And if that self hears the message, that can cause a flip to happen. So I uh, suggest that you take a look at Paul Hederman. And if you do that, uh, and you start to hear what he's saying, um, bring it back to class and let me know, and let me know if you have any questions about it. Is it H-E-T-T? No, it's H-E-D-D-E-R-M-A-N, yeah. Paul Hederman. He has a website. He's, he's a character. He's a character. He has a website called Zen Bitch Slap. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got to have... You know, you got to have a sense of humor about all this stuff, and he he does he he does have a sense of humor. I mean, a lot of times during his talks, he he starts to crack up at his own what he's saying, and he can't, and he can't stop laughing when he starts seeing the you know how funny some of the things are that we are doing to ourselves, right? All right, so let's do a practice. <clears throat> 